presentation, press the Start Broadcast button on the GoToWebinar control panel to allow all attendees to hear you. This system will notify you once you begin your broadcast. The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everybody, and uh, th uh, thank you so much for bearing with me. I have managed to be late for my own webinar, uh, which is embarrassing, so apologies for that. Um, part of the reason is that the, the Spanish session, which I normally program just before, has uh, run over in a good Spanish custom by a good 20 minutes, and I, I couldn't make it up until now. Anyways, um, enough excuses. Thank you so much for being with me on, on this Friday. Uh, can you guys confirm that uh, audio and video is okay from your end? Hello, hello. Yeah, okay, well, thanks so much for those of you answering. Uh, always a pleasure. So, um, yeah, well, let's get going with today's subject. Um, it's one of those which I think you know, most people would deem boring, um, and yeah, perhaps they're right. Um, however, I still think that understanding what goes on in the background in situations like this is interesting, given that you're going to wire your monies to uh, a broker, uh, that broker being DarwinX or some other one. And I'll, I'll try to explain to you um, what sort of risks you're, you're running when you do so, uh, how you're covered, and what you should look out for um, to, to make sure that you're never caught on the wrong foot when it comes to uh, losing your money for the wrong reasons. So uh, without further ado, let's get going on how segregated accounts work. Uh, if you have any questions or comments, by all means, uh, do go ahead and uh, post them in, in here. If I can, I will try to tackle there and then. If I can't, uh, because either I don't know, if I don't know, I will just simply tell you that I don't know. <laughs> uh, if I do, but it's not really possible to explain at that point, I will ask for your patience uh, until the end of the session where we'll do a Q&A. So the agenda for today, what is a segregated account? Let's start with the basics. Uh, second one is uh, what happens with my money once it is with a broker? And that one, I think there's much more to that one that meets the eye. So I will try to give you a bit of a crash course on uh, broker internal processes when it comes to handling your monies. And last but not least, what are my risks and should I be wor worried about any of them? So uh, on the first one, so what does account segregation mean? Well, what it means, and I apologize for this Spanish leftover text on the left-hand side, is that uh, obviously a broker is a company like many others. As such, it has its own bank account as an asset, which we can see on the left-hand side. And then it has put down its own capital uh, and it will have an, uh, basically which is owed to its shareholders and some uh, outstanding, uh, well, financing, which will be owed to its uh, debt holders. Now, one thing is the broker as a company. Another thing is client monies. And what segregation essentially means is that they should always stay apart from each other because otherwise the risk to a customer is that the underlying brokerage company goes down and uh, customer money goes missing which is not a nice thing to have when you're trading with a broker. So uh, the FCA takes this very, very seriously and uh, sets out a number of rules which state that monies are never, and I repeat, never to be commingled between company and customers. Um, if any breach, so basically any breach to these kind of rules is considered a serious offense and we could face any number of troubles uh, from a, a large fine, B, our license being removed, and C, me, yourselves, yours truly, going to jail for doing the wrong thing. So this is the kind of thing we never want to, hap uh, to happen. So when it comes to segregated accounts, we're talking about uh, they come in two flavors. Uh, the left-hand side flavor is what's called an omnibus account, one where different clients uh, have their own bank accounts outside of DarwinX, say, and whenever they wire monies to DarwinX, all their monies are put together in a customer segregated omnibus account, uh, which means, so omnibus means all, all the funds are pooled. Uh, and uh, yes, it is segregated from, from the broker itself, but it is client A is not segregated uh, from client B the way it is with segregated accounts. Now, you might think that this makes a difference and uh, the right-hand side stays safer than the left-hand side. But as you'll understand in a while, it uh, that is actually neither here nor there. The risks are the exact same. 
However, uh, there are there's some convenience, for instance, to having uh, your own bank account with, with a, a bank, say Saxo Bank, rather than sending things coming to a broker. And I presume that was one of the reasons why Saxo uh, transformed from a broker into a bank a number of years ago. But uh, the subject is just uh, beyond the, the scope for today. Uh, for now, let me tell you that uh, one or the other doesn't make any difference because the, the ultimate risks are the same in either case. Uh, and what matters, of course, is that once your money is out of your bank account, is no longer within your control and you depend on somebody else wiring it back to you. And that should be a cause for further investigation at the very least. So um, what does, hang on, I think I jumped something here. Hmm. I think I'm missing a slide here. Anyway, what, what the segregated account rules mean is that were there to be a bankruptcy, so were the company that you wired the monies to in, uh, as, as your broker to go down, then uh, whatever client deposits were owed to customers uh, are priority um, party to any bankruptcy proceedings, meaning, uh, you as a customer would get paid first before anybody else got any of the assets in the in the estate. Uh, you're, you're, you're protected in, in that sense. Uh, so ultimately, as a, as a customer who doesn't want that to happen, what you want to, to make sure is that you know that there are four risks, as we'll discuss in a second. The first one is, is the management fit and proper? So fit as in uh, intellectually or qualified enough to run a broker and proper meaning honest enough to, to be worthy of the FCAs and the customer's trust. Second is the market risk. What happens when the markets move? And we shall see uh, in the, on the basis of an extreme example, the, the movement of the franc, uh, Swiss franc on January 15th, um, 2015, I think it was. Um, liquidity. Um, what happens in those rare events where the, most, the world's liquid the world's most liquid market actually isn't liquid at all, and there is no market, as happened on that day. And last but not least, a counterparty, because that can give rise to a number of counterparty risks. And I'll explain what those were and uh, what they could mean for you. Now, before you go nuts thinking that there's all these risks and all these other stuff, uh, I shall just uh, reassure you that you don't need to worry about those four risks uh, because the Financial Services Compensation Scheme, the, the British uh, deposit insurance institution that covers any uh, bond holder, sorry, uh, deposit holders with a bank and also deposit holders with regulated entities, covers all those risks provided up to 50,000 um, sterling per person. Now, before you all start asking legitimate questions, uh, I'll just put them out there and say that I don't know the answer yet, but I will find out for you. So two of the clever questions that came in the Spanish webinar were, okay, what happens if I happen to have, say, four corporate accounts with four different corporates with RNX? Would I be covered if the sum of those four accounts exceeded the 50,000 sterling account? And the answer is, I don't know yet, but I will come back to you and answer that. And the second derivative of that question is, what happens if I have a 60, you know, say 50,000 pounds uh, with one broker and 50,000 pounds with another broker, but in total, I've got more than 50,000 pounds with um, under the FSCS's watch. Would I be covered should those two brokers go down at the same time? And the answer again is, I don't know. I will ask the people with FSCS. <laughs> I actually don't even know if they'll know, but uh, we'll, there's only one way to find out. And I will try to come back with an answer, presumably in a blog post um, coming coming soon. Okay. So before that, I just to let you know that uh, this is all just a very nice intellectual um, exercise. If you are uh, holding less than fifty thousand pounds with uh, with your your broker, if if that were to be essentially Darwinix as well. All right. Um, any questions up to this point? Nope. Okay. Looks like we're good. Oh, there we go. So 50 has given another valuable contribution here. So like bank guarantee, it's per institution. So uh, basically you could hold the monies. Uh, so provided you don't hold more than 50K per, per broker, then you're safe. So 
I I presume that treatment is the same as with bank deposits, and I think that's actually what it is. So uh, basically, the regulator is telling you to to not put all your eggs in one basket. Okay, I'm, I'm actually quite sure about that 250. So I guess uh, I'll just look it up to be uh, on the safe side. I know that's the case for banks. Back when the days where everybody was panicking about banks, that's one of the questions that I got asked, and it was that like like that. I'll just check that it's the same with brokers, but I can't see any reason why it should be any different. Okay, uh, so uh, there's that. So the first first point, of course, is management honesty. Um, um, even if the bank accounts are segregated and there are rules to keep them separate from each other, the fact is um, a couple of guys within the Arbonex, myself and another person, have access to, to the bank account um, uh, authorities. So if the two of us were to act in sync uh, and there's a number of other rules that are there, we could still wire the monies to Brazil and try to go there. Uh, that is not to say, of course, that it would be a free lunch in the sense that the FCA has the details of anybody who, hum, who comes even close to customer monies with a broker. They know our personal details, uh, personal address and uh, phone number. It is a criminal offense to do so, so to, to run away with the money, so we would have to pay for it. And then, of course, uh, as a father of four who's worked all his career in finance, I can tell you it would be no pleasure to be banned from the sector in which I hold an expertise. So you can bet this is not something that that really crossed uh, my mind for that matter. But anyways, the fact is the risk is there. So you should uh, basically try and check out um, if you're going to wire monies to any broker, uh, you know, things like do these guys disclose who they are? Uh, can I see their LinkedIn profiles? Can I see their photographs? Can I see where they live, what they do, and so on? Because the fact is, um, you know, it's it's much harder to disappear when you've disclosed a ton of things about your your own personal life than it is when you haven't. And that's the very reason why we're very open about who we are and where we are, because we have nothing to hide. So enough of that. Uh, then let's talk about the market risk one, the far more interesting one. And we're now back to back in time to the 15th of January, 2015. And all of a sudden, woohoo, uh, things go crazy. And roughly around 10 a.m. in the morning, all hell breaks loose. And the franc Swiss, uh, the Swiss franc, which was uh, quoting a uh, at close to 1.2 to the euro, all of a sudden appreciates like hell, uh, crosses even the parity for by quite a bit, uh, eventually to retrench around parity. And very importantly, it does so without continuity in the price. There's a huge gap, uh, even with a market like theoretically open market, where nobody, and by that I mean nobody, can get in or out of trades in the interval between, I think it was 119 and 104, at least in our case, with our liquidity providers. Okay, so what happens then? Right. Um, well, that actually depends on the type of provider that is delivering your execution. And there are two types of providers. One of it is a, a dealer or a broker dealer. 95% uh, of so-called uh, Forex brokers aren't Forex brokers, but are Forex broker deal, uh, sorry, for broker dealers or, for, or Forex dealers directly. And then there's a, a small minority that includes a Darwin X that is actually a broker in the sense that it doesn't act on its own account, but simply as an agent on behalf of customers. And that does make a difference, as we shall see in a second, uh, especially when it comes to market risk. So dealers do take market risk, so they do care where the markets move. Uh, brokers do not, at least not in the first approximation. So because of that reason, we will have to liaise with both cases in a sequence. So we'll start with dealers uh, by looking at both the client side of things on the left-hand side and the dealer side of things on the right-hand side. And no, this is not a traffic light, uh, in case anybody is wondering. Uh, it's a, a pretty poor attempt at trying to disclose the, the economics of the whole situation. So let me try and explain what goes on in the top left-hand side uh, of, the, uh, of the thing. And I apologize, uh, apologies for not having been able to re remove Largo and corto. Largo and corto means long and short. So I'm just going to hang on for a second. Uh, long and short so you don't get confused. Sorry about that. But now it's fixed. 
So we've got a, a client who was along the Swiss franc, short the euro. So he borrowed euros to buy uh, Swiss franc. Uh, of course, if the Swiss franc appreciates, he has made a profit and this shows up in his equity being green, meaning it has grown. So the Swiss franc has grown, the euro has shrunk and the equity has, has grown in this trade, which makes him a winner. On the on the trade, and of course, whichever dealer was taking the opposite side of uh, of that same trade for the very same reason that this guy is a winner, this guy must be a loser for the same and opposite amount. Now at the bottom, we've got the same situation but reversed. So we've got the losing customer. The euro depreciated. He had more liabilities than he had assets, and that ate into his equity. And similarly, the 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 dealer uh, had profits to for precisely that that reason. Now, how does money move? And this is relevant because we have this is a, a webinar about segregating accounts, and we have said that accounts can never be commingled, but nevertheless things have to be settled. So what goes on in the background? It's actually quite uh, quite simple. So in this case, when we're talking about a dealer whose customers lost in this trade, it's quite simple. All he does is write a check or order a wire from the customer account to the, his own dealer account for whatever losses he had made from his customers. So the dealers invoice customers for losses. All you see here is, the, yes, the accounts remain segregated, but the dealer has, uh, it, this is one of the, the cases where the dealer is authorized to take money out of the customer's account and to put it into their, uh, their bank account. So no risk here, but then of course, the opposite side is when it bites. So what happens when a, a dealer faces winning customers? Well, again, then in this case, the situation is reversed. The, the dealer would have to wire monies to the customer account. They, they credit the winners uh, for, for the profits. And that, of course, implies a risk. So what happens if there's uh, the amount that's owed by the, the dealer is more than is in his account, uh, even after liquidating whatever assets he could turn into, into liquidity. Well, at that point, what we've got is a, a broken house uh, that has gone down and there's a risk in the situation for customers. And at this, in this case, of course, uh, what would happen is the financial services compensation scheme in the case of our um, market making dealer, such as say, and I'm talking about the broker, uh, the big ones, not because they're bad, it's just because they're big. So we're talking, say, uh, the likes of IG markets and so on. In this situation is when then the FSCS would step in to liquidate IG and uh, make sure that uh, whatever monies were missing in the customer accounts were transferred by the British taxpayer to the IG's customers on account of uh, IG. They would do so because it's in the long-term interest of the British state to guarantee that promises are kept, even if it means short-term losses. So that's how that bit would work. Now, if you're thinking, I'm afraid, well, they don't be. Remember, uh, if you're trading with a regulated uh, party, then this is none of your concern unless you've got more than uh, 50K in there in the, in the account. So don't be afraid. But the fact is, this is how it all works. Uh, and now we talk about the, the slightly more compli compli uh, sorry, complicated case where we're talking about a pure broker. And brokers, unlike dealers, trade with customers against the market. So what well, we've got um, a slightly different setup in here where we've got the client facing leg of the trade. Then we've got a broker such as Darwin X in the middle. And then we've got a prime broker, um, which which is the one that hit, allows Darwin X to hedge whatever client risk uh, it's taking on behalf uh, against customers. So in this case, as I should have explained in a second, uh, a pure broker has no market risk because whatever risk it takes on against customers, it takes against the market as well so that it remains in the middle uh, on, on a fully matched principle. Importantly, there's a slight complication introduced here, and that is the fact that unlike, hang on, I'm just I, another Spanish word remained in here. I need to fix. Apologies for that. So unlike uh, as with the um, with the dealers, we've got an additional account in here, the PB account, the prime broker account, which means whenever you wire monies to Darwin X, some of those monies are with Barclays. As much as we possibly can, we leave with Barclays. But the fact is, we need margin 
to allow you to trade against the market. In this case, it would be, say, uh, the Saxo Prime Broker unit and the LMAX. So some of the monies that are wired to us, we wire onwards to the Prime Broker accounts. Uh, this is one of the reasons why we trade with the larger and more respected counterparties rather than trading with, um, well, I don't want to give you names, but there are less, uh, less solvent ones out there. Uh, but the fact is, as I said, not all the monies are in the bank. The part of them is with the prime broker. And uh, what happens in these cases, let's just move on to the cash movement. So let's say we're talking about customers who were uh, on the losing end of the, um, of the situation, uh, the, whose, basic, whose euros depreciated against the Swiss francs. Well, in these situations, uh, the broker, say Darwin X, would have made a profit on the client phrasing leg of the trade. But because we would have taken the exact same trade as the customer with the prime brokers, there would be a loss on the prime broker or the market facing leg of the trade. And both would be of equal and opposite sign. So we would be neither here nor there. So the customers would lose, the prime broker would win, and we wouldn't care because both would offset each other. Which is all nice and good. That's the reason why there's no market risk in our case, because we're a broker. But this gives rise to something else. This gives rise to counterparty risk. And what does that actually mean? Well, what it means is, and again, I should have done a search replace for Banco, but for now you can you know it's bank. Uh, what it means is that in this situation, uh, whenever the, the, uh, there was enough margin on the client's account for them to stay in the trade, no problem, we go down together with them as long as there's margin. But then at some point, if this goes on too far, you realize this is eating into the customer's margin, which means at some point there'll be no customer money left, but there will still be an open trade on the other side of things. And this is exactly what took FXCM down on that very day. So on that day, what happened was that there were a bunch of customers who lost all the money they had in margin, and then an additional 300 million bucks and the problem that FXCM and every other broker, including us, had was that there was no way that the stop loss order on the other side of the trade, which would have taken them out of the losing trade as the elevator went all the way down from 1.2 to 1.00, that actually broke down. There was no way to get out at any step in the middle. And that's when this lack of liquidity, this gap in the market, created a liquidity event and a counterparty risk. The counterparty risk in this case was with the customer customers because the customers made the broker lose more than they had deposited. And unlike us then with the dealer, and we'll come back to that in a second, that was actually real bucks lost by the broker. In the case of FXCM, I believe they lost in excess of 300 million euros, largely on the client uh, facing end of the, of the trade. Any questions up, up to here? This is the more kind of complex side of things. The whole thing happened not because there was a large move. That's okay, as long as there was a market. The, the movement happened because there was a very large move with no intermediate liquidity in the process. So let's say the customer lost everything at 1.17, by which point the broker typically would have uh, shut that, uh, basically closed out the position on the prime broker end of the trade. But there was no liquidity at that point. So uh, basically, the, the, the loss from 1.17 to 1.00, so 1.17, the customer's money was all gone. But then from 1.17 to 1.00, it wasn't the customer's money. It was the broker's money that was being lost. Because of course, it's the broker who has to make up for any shortfalls in the client accounts. So if one customer loses more than his deposit, then it, the next one in line is the broker's capital. That's what you see here, this, this yellow thing. So whatever loss on the yellow, uh, so basically if this is a customer A who's lost this all this yellow amount above what they had posted down in margin, then that translates one to one into a loss for the, for the broker here in the middle. And in the case of, uh, of FXCM, they had this loss on, on the client uh, facing end of the trades whenever customers were losing Swiss francs. So we're losing, uh, sorry, we're betting um, against the Swiss franc. Okay, so that was that. Then, of course, there's uh, this, uh, another thing which is often overlooked, and that's the, the importance of not trading in over-the-counter markets, and that is that you can have a double whammy, one of them being your customers lose more than they had deposited with you. Uh, 
but also you you might have had winning uh, customers and then on the other side of the trade you were open you had hedged your, your exposure against um, counterparties who could not face the loss so Basically, your customers had won a ton of money. You had won a ton of money with them, but the counterparty in the market against which you had done that trade was uh, bankrupt and you couldn't claim the monies. So at that point, you were owed the monies by the losing customers and you owed uh, to the winning customers whatever wins they had made, but your counterparty had gone down at the same time, so the money wasn't there. So you get hit from both sides. And I don't know which part of the hit was the bigger one on uh, FXCM. What I can tell you is there were figures talking about five to 10 billion losses in all the over-the-counter middlemen chains that uh, basically make up all sorts of over-the-counter assets. So um, I don't know the details because that's the sort of thing that no one likes to talk about, but you can imagine there were a lot of people who basically had a bad a bad piece of news on, the, on that day. And it wasn't just the retail brokers. Okay, so that, that basically covers both the, the case of a market risk and also counterparty risk because of a liquidity event in the sense that uh, all this happened because you couldn't get out, out, out of um, um, the, the Swiss franc trade because there was no market for something like 20 minutes. I think it was, by the way. Okay, so that explains the, the, the risks and, and uh, oh, oh. So I have to apologize and I have to translate because I, I have, in addition to the thing, I, my, my presentation has broken down and some of the parts did not translate into the, the English version. So what we do is we cross-check all outstanding client monies on a daily basis to make sure that uh, whatever is held in the bank accounts and in the broker, uh, prime broker accounts exceeds or at least matches whatever we owe customers. In other words, there's money to, the, there's assets to make a good on the liabilities we have vis-a-vis -vis customers. This has to be done on a daily basis. Whenever there's an, uh, an exemption, we have an obligation to report any mismatch. And that is a very serious event uh, that's typically investigated by the, by the FCA. This has never happened with us, by the way. Uh, we have to provide detailed reports on the client ma money and assets re regime of the of the FCA, and we have to face a very exhaustive um, um, uh, yearly audit by our auditors, who have very specific instructions to check to cross check pretty much random days and customers to make sure that the money is really there. Uh, and of course, we can exp um, expect a visit by the FDA any any time, which makes this uh, you know you you, you really want to have your uh, your books in order at all times. So that was pretty much what I had in mind for today. Uh, at this point, I, I'd be very very happy to take whatever questions you might have, um, and I'd hopefully clarify anything that I, I've left a bit of a mess. Okay, uh, so for as long as there's no questions, and I know there's a, quite a few friends out there, I'd like to tell you that we have uh, some good news for the week of the 9th of uh, May, but I want you to, to stay tuned and figure out what those are. Uh, and also, the, the, the session will be, will be, has been recorded. I still have to decide whether I can put up with the shame of uh, there being some Spanish text in it, but I think it's it, it's a minor thing in the bigger scheme of things. So we'll we'll put it out to the YouTube channel so that um, everybody can, can uh, read these. And it uh, looks like there's no questions. So thank you, Nicola. Uh, and thank you, everyone else. I mean, I hope it's, you have a, a fantastic. You've had a fantastic week, and if you haven't, I'm sure your weekend's going to be fantastic. So don't worry. Uh, good things come to those who wait. So thank you so much. Um, best wishes, and I will speak again next uh, next Friday. And as I mentioned, uh, there's big news coming in the week of the 9th of May. So have a great weekend and uh, take care. Bye bye.